This is Anya Leonard, founder and director of Classical Wisdom. You are listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks, a podcast dedicated to bringing ancient wisdom to modern minds. Today's episode is with Barry Strauss, professor of history and classics, Bryce and Edith M. Bauer professor in humanistic studies at Cornell University in New York. Barry is also the best-selling author of eight books including The Death of Caesar, the story of history's most famous assassination, as well as his most recent book, Ten Caesars, Roman Emperors from Augustus to Constantine. Before we get started, a quick reminder. Classical Wisdom Speaks is made possible by our Classical Wisdom members. If you wish to become a member and support the classics, please go to classicalwisdom.com and click Start Here. Thank you, Barry, for joining us today. Thank you, Anya. It's a pleasure to be here. So you are quite the expert in Roman history, and particularly Mm -hmm. Roman Empire. And people always love to discuss what brought about the end of the Roman Empire. Um, So I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, uh, the key events and developments that led to the downfall, and what that basically means for us today. Well, you know, um, it's a great question, and if I had to pick one event that symbolizes the end of the Roman Empire, it would be the sack of Rome in 410 by Alaric. It was an event that shocked people all over the the Roman world. But, you know, in a funny way, it was a non-event because Rome was no longer the capital of the empire. Uh, The emperors had moved on. And they ruled the empire from places like Milan in the west um, and uh, Constantinople in the east. So um, it shows that the the Romans had had really changed and they'd really changed their their defense and security uh, concerns as well. You know, if we ask what what caused the fall of the Roman Empire, I guess the, the, uh, the snappy answer would be, the invaders, <laughs> but uh, why the Romans were unable to deal with the invaders, uh, I think just as really two reasons. For one thing, the, the, the barbarians got good. Uh, the Germans had been in contact with the Romans for centuries on the frontier zone on the border, and they learned from the Romans, Roman discipline and order. So they were more formidable uh, opponents. For another thing, they themselves were under more pressure from invaders from further east, uh, which was driving them into the Roman Empire. Um, The Romans also had the problem and the bad fortune that in the in the east, uh, a different opponent, the uh, Sasanian Persians, uh, a regime that only came to power in the third century AD, uh, proved a very serious threat to the Romans and much more dangerous regime than the previous uh, Iranian regime, the, the Parthian regime. So the Romans faced more threats both in East and West. Uh, They divided their resources, which in some ways was helpful because it allowed them to turn in either direction. But in other ways, it meant that uh, on the key Western front, uh, their resources were were divided. They weren't all there. The other factor was that at a period in which the Romans could ill afford uh, to take their eye off the ball, they took their eye off the ball in the late fourth, and particularly in the fifth century, uh, the Roman Empire was divided and torn in uh, political disputes and um, internecine domestic warfare. It's precisely the time when the Romans should have been prioritizing the barbarian threat more than anything else, and ultimately they paid the price for it. And do you think, therefore, then, the sort of decline was all from external features, or that there was issues within the empire that made it weaker, you know, inflation or bureaucracy. These are things well, that people often discuss. Great question. There are two schools of thought about this, uh, and I guess I incline to 
uh, the point of view of the uh, great historian who said the Roman Empire did not commit suicide, it was murdered. Um, I don't think it committed suicide. It's certainly true that Italians uh, gave up military service. By and large, the army was composed of Roman citizens from outside Italy. But that doesn't mean it was any less strong or less good. Um, so I don't think it was the internal problems that bedeviled the empire as so much as, as the external threats. So most people like talking about the end of the Roman Empire because they like to see parallels to our modern era. I mean, do you think that's the case? Is there things that we can learn from the fall of the Roman Empire that are sort of applicable and teachable to us today? Sure. I mean, they're not pretty lessons, but I think the main one is that foreign threats are real uh, and that any society has to pay attention to security, it has to pay great attention to security, and it has to always know when to balance the freedom of domestic debates and domestic divisions, which after all any free society should have, with the need from time to time to have unity and focus on threats from abroad. Um, you know, I don't want to say there were no internal problems in the, in the later Roman Empire. As I said, the political divisions were great, and the cost of defense went up, which put a strain on the economy and on society. And I think one of the lessons from the Romans that we can learn is that it can be very difficult to deal with threats from determined militaristic enemies who don't really mind the price that they're going to have to pay. Um, not fun lesson, but I think yeah. ones that we need to pay attention to. Yeah, I mean, you see, you see like the battle of um, Karai and, and Crassus's sort of failed attempt with Partha, and, and you right. really can see how the asymmetrical tactics and right the, the romans could still be defeated by somebody who should should not have been able to defeat them yes no that's really true um of course the romans were able to bounce back from that uh, but arguably they then went on to spend devote much too much attention to making war on the parthians and on the eastern frontier when in fact i think the wiser emperors like augustus and even nero ironically were content with negotiated solutions on that frontier, which I think was really the better choice for Rome. Yeah. So another interesting parallel, I suppose, to the modern era and Roman Empire is that it was quite international, the empire. Um, right. And that they had, like you mentioned before, a lot of immigrants who, who worked uh, as soldiers. So why was it that the Romans encouraged immigration and what did that do for the empire? Well, you know, immigration was a complex phenomenon for the Romans. For one thing, a lot of the immigrants were involuntary immigrants. They were slaves uh, who were brought to Italy uh, from various places in the empire, mostly in the second, first, in the first centuries BC and the first century AD. Um, after Trajan, Rome wasn't conquering new places, so um, there, there weren't a lot, the number of slaves being brought to the empire was much smaller, but they were very significant, very uh, significant part of the immigrant group. Uh, the Romans encouraged professionals to come to Rome, like doctors and teachers. Julius Caesar encouraged physicians and, and, and teachers to come to Rome. Uh, and then other people came to Rome because it was a magnet. Uh, it was the largest and wealthiest city in the Mediterranean world, and perhaps even in the entire world, at, at the time, uh, a city of maybe a million people, which is enormous by ancient standards. And there are a lot of people around the Roman Empire and even from outside the empire who want to go to Rome to trade, to make money, to do business, to set up enterprises, uh, and uh, also to get involved in politics uh, and either working in politics, working in administration, or to advance their careers. So uh, it's, it's a real draw. It's a real draw to people. And I think one of the things that's so impressive about the Romans is that in spite of grumbling on a part of elites, and in spite of the fact that the emperors from time to time would expel people from Rome, expel foreigners from Rome, by and large, they welcomed them and they integrated them in their society. I think that gave the Romans flexibility and pragmatism. I think it's one of the lessons for us that any society in order to succeed and to survive has to know how to manage change and has to know how to incorporate new people into the society. And this is 
obviously a big challenge, a big topic in the United States today, and I think uh, around the world today. And there are things we can learn from the Romans. Oh, yes, yeah, definitely. Um, and a very important lesson. Um, yes. I, I personally feel I've, I'm almost always an immigrant myself, so I see it from the other side. Yeah. Um, so uh, another kind of interesting element of Roman Empire history uh, is the role of women. Obviously, the society was quite misogynistic. Yeah. And women, almost always, they never have a great time. But we do know some very famous examples of extremely powerful women. Yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about some of those women and uh, how they were able to wield their powers? Yes. Well, it's, it is really ironic that the Roman emperors gave a, a lot of power to women in the imperial household. And it's partly because uh, Rome, Roman aristocracy had always depended on the family and always had looked inward to the family. And even in the late Republic, there are some uh, powerful women like Brutus's mother, Servilia, who was also Julius Caesar's lover, which is an interesting story in and of itself. She wielded a lot of political power. Um, it's followed up in the early empire by uh, Augustus's wife, Livia. He had married up into marrying her. She was a member of the bluest blood of the Roman aristocracy, and he was only partly a member of the Roman nobility. His father had come from the Italian upper middle class, which Roman nobles looked down on. Uh, she was a very uh, capable, educated woman, extremely intelligent, and very versed in politics and the ways of power. Uh, Augustus gave a lot of power to her, also to his sister Octavia. They were both liberated from any control by men, which was unheard of for Roman women. Uh, they both had a lot of wealth and they exercised it. Livia had a household of a thousand people and she, um, she was a patron. People who she patronized often went on very far in Roman politics. She pushed the interests of her sons, one of whom ends up as Augustus's successor, the Emperor Tiberius. Uh, Augustus consults her as an advisor. She took notes on those consultations, by the way, and later on after Augustus's death, when she has conferences with Tiberius, she pulls out the letters sometimes and say, look, these are my notes. I have letters from Augustus. These are the notes I took as well. Um, this is the real story. Um, so she was a powerful and influential person. She uh, had influence over Roman women and influence in religion as well. She uh, retailed a story about a miracle that had supposedly taken place. Uh, and she sold the story, let people know about the story to seem as if the gods were on her side and uh, the side of Augustus. And she tried to set an example of a traditional Roman woman um, that um, fit in with Augustus's social policies, which were in some ways more repressive for women because he emphasized family, chastity. Um, he was anti-celibate. And when Rome became a Christian empire, the Christians had to repeal Augustus's laws against celibacy. He wanted to insist that women would get married and have children and rebuild the population. So for all those reasons, Livia had enormous power. Mythology legend is that she was wicked, that she was a poisoner, that she arranged for the death of Augustus's grandchildren, his birth grandchildren, so that he would have no choice but to turn to her son as his successor. I think we can uh, write that off as misogyny and just the, the fear and suspicion that Romans had of powerful women. So she is, she's one that, of the great. Oh, sorry, with a lot of that from I, Claudius, you know, Robert Gray's book. Yeah, I mean, I mean we, we get that in Robert Gray's from, from in the TV show, the novel, but he's getting it from Tacitus, who is a writer uh, in the second century AD. Uh, and Tacitus is purve purveying these rumors about Livia and supposedly what she did. So do you think Livia um, is just an exception to the rule that she just happens to be a very unique woman among a few others? Or is there anything sort of systematically in the Roman culture that allowed women to be successful? I think there is. I don't think she's, I, she is unusual. She's an extreme, but there are many powerful women in the imperial court. And there are also a lot of women in Roman society in this period who are out there in the working world uh, and who are getting ahead. 
to me, one of my one of the examples that I like is Trajan's wife Plotina, who is also the power who the patron who's pushing Hadrian to be Trajan's successor against Trajan's will, and she succeeds in the end. She's a very wealthy woman who owns a series of brickyards, brickworks, in a time when Rome is having enjoying a construction boom. And the foreman of one of her brickworks is a woman, which I find really remarkable and says a lot about the power of women in Roman society in this period. Um, there are a number of other examples of, of powerful imperial women. Vespasian. So Vespasian's mistress is a woman named Canis. She is a freedwoman, a former slave, probably Greek. Earlier in her life, she had been the secretary to Antonia the Younger, so the second child of Octavia and Mark Antony, who was a very important person in the court of Tiberius. And when they determined that Sejanus was involved in a conspiracy that could have uh, cost Tiberius the throne, it's Canis who writes the letter to Tiberius that informs him of this conspiracy and turns things around. Well, I suspect that Canis helped Vespasian in his rise to the throne. He went from being a military officer from a non-noble family to becoming emperor. When he became emperor, he was a widower, and he took her as his mistress. She was now a freedwoman. As a senator, he was not allowed to marry a freedwoman. But she was his mistress. She became the most powerful woman in Rome. Uh, some sources claim that she abused it, that she sold access to the emperor. Again, we don't know if that's true or if it's just misogyny. We do know that she lived on an estate uh, to the north of the city that later on after her death was turned into her and turned into baths. And we have this remarkable tombstone, this grave monument, really. It's carved on four sides that was put up to her after her death by one of her freedmen uh, in her memory. Uh, and it's very discreet. It doesn't say that she was associated with, um, with Vespasian, with the emperor, but it has laurel wreaths, which are a symbol of the emperor. And it gives the message of just how powerful and important she was. So, yeah, I mean, the, these powerful women were not the rule, but there are quite a few of them. And I think Roman society is willing to allow these powerful female figures in the household with, with some limits on it. It's certainly not an egalitarian society, but they're quite real. Classical Wisdom members can enjoy the full podcast with Barry Strauss, professor of classics at Cornell University, on classicalwisdom.com. All listeners can also find Barry's podcast, Antiquitas, at barrystrauss.com. Thank you again for listening to Classical Wisdom Speaks.